Why do you think I would want us to start that way? A weekend of systematic theology. Why would we want to start that way? Any idea? What do you think? It's God What's that? God okay, there's a God focus to this. We just got our gaze fixed upon God himself. Good. Good. Why else? To make it personal. To make it personal. Good. Why else? Oh, wait, let's pause here. What's personal about what we just did? Um, it's us communicating with God. Okay, we're actually all communicating with God. Good. So it's personal, it's God-focused. What else? Why else would we do this? What about what we did just did is important to begin a weekend of systematic theology? What do you think? Because studying theology or, or studying God has to begin with um, faithful praise and a, a fear of the Lord. Okay, good. Study of God has to begin. I like that he made it a mandate. Has to begin with faithful praise and a fear of the Lord, which is certainly present when we sing through this hymn. Good. Let me pause right here because we just got some great answers that to some of you may have given you a twinge of cynicism because maybe already in your Christian education you're feeling cynicism creep in and you think maybe the answers that were just given were a bit too obvious. A bit too Sunday school pat answer, okay, thanks a lot Sunday school boy, but uh, don't we all know that? Can't we assume these things? God focus, all in praise. Yeah. Now, I, hopefully it's not the majority of you, but I just do want to speak to the possibility that some of you may be feeling that. Some of you may be feeling an inclination to cynicism where you think something needs to be never have been heard before to be true and real and important. And, and you think things need to be so creative and sublime that maybe you're not quite sure exactly what it all means. Well, if you felt any cynicism toward these, these dear ones who started us off by stating what some of you may think is too obvious, after all, we're all Christians. Can't we assume all this God-centered stuff and get on with it? All this necess necessity of praise and get on with it? No. No, I promise you, you don't get God-centeredness well enough. I promise you. I have no doubt about that. You haven't heard this emphasis enough. And I actually want to thank those who swung the bat right off the bat and, to, and we're willing to say things, even in an environment where that could be perceived as too simplistic. Do you know God hates being an unspoken assumption? He hates it. And it's never the case that that's just how it is and we can get on with more interesting things. Yes, we need a radical God-centeredness, and that's what this hymn provides for us and what worship provides for us, and we need a worshipful, God-fearing start to all of this. So, so that's desperately important. Good. Good. Other thoughts of why we might do it this way? What do you think? Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the academics of yeah. theology Good. and forget that it's supposed to be about God. Yes. Excellent. You can get caught up in the academics of theology, the debates, all of the concepts and the ideas, forgetting that what we do at Biola is theology that is profoundly personal. You're the one who said that, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> it, it's profoundly personal and relational and worshipful. This is anything but mere academics, right? It's most certainly academic, but it's academics pursuing relationship with God. And we need to see this fundamental truth all over the place. Good, so um, do you really think it's important to know God according to truth, according to his revelation of himself? Do you really think that's important that we need to avail ourselves to God's truth? to know him, and that's really important that we get this theology right? Or does that sound too academic to you? Do you realize the relationship between love and knowledge? There is one, you know, a profound relationship between love 
and knowledge. The more you know someone, the greater your capacity to love them, yes? And that's the idea. We, we tend to think of love as a pretty vague thing. Relationship is a pretty vague thing. But I want you to realize that as we seek to know God, we seek to love God. I, my Theology 1 class I teach, I, I tell the students, we really should rename it Good Love in 101. <laughs> Because that's what it's about. A lot of people would sign up for that class if we retitled it that. But, <laughs> but, um, but that's what it's about. And knowledge and love go hand in hand, don't they? And we, we get that on a human level better than we tend to on a God level. What do I mean by that? Tell me your name. Brian. Brian. Hi, Brian. Tell me your name. Haley. Haley. Brian and Haley. Hey, you guys know each other? We just talked about tennis together. You play tennis. Good. <laughs> Good. This, this, this is Haley, Brian. You, you, so you, okay, good. Um, all right, Haley, say Brian asks you on a date. Just hypothetically. Okay. All right. Um, and he takes you out. He's really creative, so he takes you to Starbucks. <laughs> and you're on a date, and you're sitting there, and you say, I like Brian. I'm gonna open up, I'm gonna share my heart, I'm gonna let him know my dreams, my loves, my hates, my, my uh, things that discourage me, my background, and you start to really share your heart. And about 15 minutes in, Brian says this, Haley, I, I love you as a sister in Christ, and I care about you obviously, or I wouldn't have asked you out, but my idea of ideal relationships are really organic and natural and flow from the gut, and and aren't so detailed and technical and, and all about these specifics. And quite frankly, all these details about you, Haley, are really making it complicated and hard to love you that way. <laughs> and so could we just dispense with all the Haley details and get on with a good, loving relationship? Bad move, Bad move she says, Brian. <laughs> She's not happy with that. Um, you don't like that. Is, you don't like his approach to love. No. All right, so we've got problems. Um, he bought you the coffee, the $5 coffee you ordered, and it's not gonna help. Yeah, that's not changing things. <laughs> Is it likely at this point Brian's gonna get another date? Not likely. Not likely. Ladies, does anyone wanna change Haley's mind? Do you think she's misjudging him? Why, what's the problem here? Because he's not trying to know me. He's trying to get something out of the relationship that isn't me. Ah, what if I told you this? He's sincere in this. He's not blowing smoke just to save time. He's, he's, he actually thinks this kind of love is the best sort of love. Is that gonna change it for you? No. no. no ladies, anybody wanna change your mind? Well, Brian, you're getting some pretty bad looks. <laughs> yeah, so what's the problem with Brian's definition of love, people? Ladies, what's his problem? He's loving an idea rather than the person. Loving an idea. And what's that idea? Like he makes love. Okay, so this conception of love is what he's loving. Good. So, yeah, keep going. What else is the problem? He can't actually love her if he doesn't know. Yeah! How can he talk about loving her if he's not intensely concerned about knowing her? If he wants to love her, he's going to know her, and the more he knows her, he's going to love her, and those two go hand in hand. And we get this at a human level. We get how absurd it is that Brian would have that conception of love on a human level. But for some reason, we think with God that it, the details don't matter that much. Sort of God's beyond that sort of uh, need to be known in that way. But we have got to see this connection between knowledge and love and the connection between belief and behavior. Uh, what you believe ultimately determines what you do. So people say things like, just be a good person. As if we have some inherent definition of goodness. Or a person for that matter. 
Don't worry about all that theology. Just be nice people. Just be good people. I just heard someone interviewed about heaven and hell yesterday, and this rabbi said that if, if Jesus won't accept me after just being a good person, I don't want to be with Jesus. Well, how do you define good, and how do you define a person? Because unless I know what a person is, I'm not going to know what that thing is supposed to be, and I'm not going to know what goodness is unless I get some sort of transcendent experience, some sort of revelation that gives me an understanding of goodness, of persons, of God, based on knowledge. Would you open your Bibles to 1 Peter? Okay, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1. Here we go. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Do you want grace and peace? Sure you do. Of course you do. Peter wants it for his hearers. How do you get it? It's right here in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You get grace and peace and everything else good that you want through knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him, that's how it comes, who called us to his own glory and excellence. So God reveals himself to us, gives knowledge of himself to us, and that becomes the source of things like grace and peace. That knowledge becomes the source of what the Bible says is the only thing worth boasting in. No, Jeremiah 9, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the rich man boast of his riches or the powerful man boast of his strength, but let him who boasts, boast in this. What is it? You know what it is that we're supposed to boast in? Really? All right, we need knowledge. Yes, uh, that he understands and knows me. That's what you boast in. That's the only thing, relatively speaking, worth exalting in worth boasting and that he understands and knows me. And then God gets specific that I, I'm the Lord and I exercise kindness and righteousness on earth and in these things I delight. That's what our lives are. You don't get grace and peace. You don't get anything worth truly boasting or exalting in except this knowledge of God at the center of who we are. And so we begin our study of theology by worshiping God. If it's not all leading to worship, it's a waste of time. Well, the beautiful thing about studying theology at a place like Biola is we actually start off this quest to know God in a relationship with God, with each other. This is not for us ever supposed to be a mere academic exercise a mere objective, detached pursuit of knowledge. No, this is profoundly personal and relational and intended to be worshipful. That's why we're created. Please fight the often occupational hazard in academics of it becoming merely academic. This is soul work. Oh, it most certainly is mind work as we love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But it's soul work. Don't forget that. Don't miss that this is heart work. And don't miss that we also just did this collectively. Learning about God takes a lot of time by yourself with a hard book and a hard chair and a library. So you got to get used to solitude. It's hard for some of us. But please, even in those moments, don't miss the profoundly 
collective, community, relational aspect of this. Yes, with God, but also with one another. Isn't it cool that we all just stood together reciting in song good theology and at the same time we all assumed the same posture and mostly in the same key <laughs> sang this song together that affirmed the goodness of God and it was also an expression of dependence on God this longing for God this desperate need for God to make this more than a mere academic exercise very concerned about this. I'm very concerned that we turn this into to just exercises in learning and we want to file away more information to impress others with, to uh, feel smart about ourselves, to it really end up being very sophomoric about it. You know, sophomore literally means what? Wise fool for good reason just enough knowledge to be arrogant, but not enough to be humble yet. And so please pray for a growing heart of humility. Pray for uh, knowing that God is real and God's revealed himself. Just this morning I, I did an interview about gay marriage on, on PBS, public broadcasting, and. And the whole issue between myself and the other religious leaders are whether or not there's a God and whether or not this God has revealed himself in a way that is clear and true and authoritative in our lives. That's what we believe here at the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. So please, fight for a worshipful heart. Fight to never lose the relational dynamic of what we're doing here. Please fight to make sure that you are seeking knowledge of God as a disciple of Christ and never merely as a student of academic disciplines. Please don't let that happen. I had a prophet in grad school said that he had lost the ability to read one of the Gospels because he had done his dissertation work in that and he had lost the ability to read this Gospel devotionally. All he thought of was the synoptic problem and how this pericope fits within the, the source critical. And before he knew it, he lost the ability to hear from God in God's word. It alarmed me he didn't see, seem overly concerned with that. He said it was an occupational hazard. And I said, if I were a construction worker and I started to lose my hearing because of my occupation, I'd either get another occupation or take drastic measures of some kind. And maybe it takes drastic measures for you right now. But God is personal. God is knowable. God has revealed himself. And we together are seeking this knowledge of God, not just with one another, But with every other believer on this campus right now and every other believer in La Mirada and in California and the United States and everywhere in the world where people are seeking knowledge of God and not even just living saints, but dead ones. Do you realize that as we seek to know God together in the quest of theology that we are entering into a sacred legacy that's been left for us by faithful saints through the centuries and some of them shed their own blood for the things of which we speak this weekend. They died for what we believe. They died for the things we'll think of. The study of theology is no mere academic game. It's not playing with ideas just for fun, although I think it should have a fun dynamic to it. After all, let's not take ourselves too seriously, even though we take God as seriously as we possibly can. But at the end of the day, these are the issues of life and death, heaven and hell. So be a serious theologian not just in your diligence, but in the sobriety with which you approach this, this quest you're on. 
realize that people have died for what we believe and, and we will leave a theological legacy. The question is never, will you leave a theological legacy? The only questions are, will it be a good one? Will you have left it better than you found it? Which is the job of the church. The pillar and buttress of truth. That's what we are. Will you leave a legacy you want your grandchildren to faithfully follow in? That's the question. So, dismiss any apathetic, cynical, um, doubtful, ambiguous understanding of what we're about. And seek to know God according to His revelation of Himself with the Spirit's help and with the people of God. That's what we're here for. It couldn't be more serious. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.